The Paul Leslie Hour, helping people tell their stories. And now, your host, Paul Leslie. Hey, it's me. Hello, and welcome to the Paul Leslie Hour. Thank you for tuning in. Before we get into the interview, I would be honored if you would consider going to thepaulleslie.com and clicking support the show. There are quite a number of things I want to accomplish with the Paul Leslie Hour, and you can help me get more of these interviews out there to the masses. It only takes a moment, and it makes a world of difference. Last but not least, tell someone about the Paul Leslie Hour. Let them know in whatever way you can. And now, let's get into the interview. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in the presence of a great artist. Jim Keltner is known as a drummer who has received great acclaim for his contributions to some of the most beloved tracks in popular music. He has been called the leading session drummer in America. Keltner is also a record producer. Noteworthy, a few of the albums he's produced would be Rock and Roll Time and Mean Old Man from Jerry Lee Lewis. And it's a long list of great artists Jim has worked with. I could go on all day, but I'm going to mention just a few. John Lennon, Ringo Starr, George Harrison, the great Bob Dylan, Eric Clapton, Carly Simon, Leon Russell, Barbara Streisand, Joe Cocker, Randy Newman, Bruce Coburn, Diana Krall, Steely Dan, Melody Gardot, and so many others. It's a great pleasure to welcome musician and Oklahoma native Jim Keltner. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you, Paul. Thank you for that uh, very illustrative introduction. I, I must, I must say, you know, it always, it always unnerves me a bit, you know, to hear the, you know, the the premier session guy thing. Even though, you know, at this point in time, it, it shouldn't, but it, it still does kind of. And I, I think is the reason why is because I, I just, I really. Uh, it feels like I'm taking credit for what the, these incredible artists that I'm working for uh, has brought to me. You know, I'm, I'm, and not only me, but I, anybody who does the kind of work that we do, uh, playing music for other people on their records and stuff. We're we're only as good as the people we're involved with, and you know the list of names you rattle off there. You know that's just a few of the of the greats. Uh, that I've worked with, and that's, you know, it's hard to go wrong when you're working with people of that talent, you know, that magnitude. So I want to get that straight first, I guess. It sounds like you are at heart a humble man. Oh, yes. Very humble. No, I, I, my wife said, now don't be sarcastic and try to be funny today. <laughs> you know, so I said, okay. And so here I am right away going, no, I, I, you know, I, it's, you could call it humble, you know, but, uh, I, I just like to get factual. I like to get stuff straight. You know, I like to, I like to put it on the table like it really, like it is, or at least my perception of the way things are. And that's the truth. You know, I just had this conversation the other day with a fellow, uh, record maker. And, uh, my point was that I was making was that, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's really down to, to, uh, who's, who you're playing with when you're doing it. And, uh, are they bringing a song that's like really gonna be special to you somehow in some kind of way? Or are you just, is it basically gonna be a job, you know, of, uh, putting nails in and sawing off edges and things, you know, so, so really it comes down to that. It it comes down to, you know, being really, really fortunate, like being lucky to work with people who, who bring, you know, their, the best that they have. And then, uh, and then all I have to do is just jump on, you know, if that sounds humble, then that's, that's cool. I'm, you know, that that's humble for me. That's fine. But what it, that's what it really is, you know. It's 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 luck. It's like really good fortune. I was just talking to my brother uh, Nathan East last night about a, a thing we're gonna we're getting ready to do together, and we were we were and I love talking with Nathan because he has the same feelings that I do 
spiritually, which is to say, you know, that we're just both so grateful, so incredibly grateful to have had the careers that we've had. You know what I mean? You know, it's it's just it's you know it it wasn't luck and it wasn't uh, it, it just it wasn't luck. It was it was good fortune for sure, but it was I think it was more than that, and uh, and I'm grateful for it. Wouldn't you say to do something like this, working with these great artists, would you say it takes a certain amount of of confidence? Well, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, certainly. And um, But, like, when I... And it's interesting you say that because not long ago I was thinking... I had somebody ask me a question similar to that, and I uh, and I was thinking back... To when I was basically a kid, you know, and I had to play with some older guys, some older people that that were really good. And I remember, I remember thinking, I should be nervous. This is, this is, and I expected to be nervous because there are other things in life that have made me nervous, you know, like, uh, you know, having to to go speak in front of somebody or go meet somebody for the first time for a job, you know, like a real job and stuff like that, I would get nervous. And so I thought, oh, I should, it seems like I should be nervous getting ready to play with uh, so-and-so here. And, and I didn't, I didn't have that, those nerves. I had only a tremendous desire to step up and make it work. I've always found that interesting, and so, you know, from from that moment on, it's it's like, uh, you know, having having like the first time, for instance, you know, with uh, any of the Beatle guys, you know, the first time playing with John, uh, he was the first one, and uh, and you know, I had flown in and uh, found myself in his little studio, and. Sitting behind the drums that were rented, you know, by a, by a really good friend. Well, he became a good friend later, Colin Allen. And sitting there, and and then hearing John's voice in the headphones, it was like it, it was like it, it it was like it it came from heaven or something. It wasn't it wasn't from here. It just wasn't, it wasn't anything tied down to any kind of natural thing. It was, it was just like, uh, it just was in the air and it just, and I just was breathing it in. And then we listened to a playback and I, and it just, it was the little song I had been, it just really touched me. It was like an incredibly beautiful little song. And he had sang it so beautifully with that that voice that I was so familiar with from the radio and you know and all that, and he looked exactly like the guy in the pictures and and uh and the magazines and stuff and and he he his voice his speaking voice was so just so incredibly uh like john it was john lennon and it, it was a moment that I remember thinking, oh, man, you know, what a what an amazing gift. And I just remember saying, thank you, Lord. And, you know, and that's what I always do. That's what I've been doing since I was a little kid. And that's what my grandma told me and my mama told me to do that. And that's what I do. And I said, thank you, Lord, and went on to the next thing. And it was it was awesome. It was awesome to to be in that situation. I was already in my 30s, you know, just a kid now to me, but <laughs> I just felt really grateful that that I was there and able to do it, able to pull it off. And, you know, and I made a, a batch of new friends then, you know, not only John, but uh, Klaus and Nikki, you know, beautiful Nikki Hopkins, just, and, and all these people, you know, and, and, uh, and Spectre. 
I just I, I still marvel at the fact that I that I found myself in that situation, you know, just just boom, you know. And and prior to that, you know, I had been with some really great, you know, Delaney and Bonnie uh, were two amazingly gifted people, and and of course Leon, who was really the the beginning for me in the in this pop world. You know, having been a producer, he was producing Gary Lewis and the Playboys for Snuff Garrett and uh, Liberty Records, I think, at, at the time. And, you know, I was a jazz player. I was a very serious-minded jazz player at that time, 1965. And I was, uh, you know, playing, you know, for nothing. And once in a while, I'd get $10 here or something like that. And, and I would play... Just everywhere I could, a lot of living rooms, and then I started playing little joints and uh, making a few bucks. But I was playing jazz, and I loved it more than anything in the world. I, I, it was it was what I wanted to be was a jazz musician. I I felt like I was living the life of a jazz musician. I was doing everything to copy basically all my favorite jazz drummers and jazz musicians, and then. Um, you know, then I got this, uh, this, I met Gary Lewis at the music store. I've told this story a million times. And then, you know, joined his little band and, and, uh, met Leon. And then we were playing on the single for Gary, uh, a song called, uh, Just My Style. You know, written by the, the, the little teams of pop writers that used to write stuff for the hit makers in those days. And so it was, it was a simple little song. Little shuffle, and Leon told me he said uh, we ran through it and uh, one time, and I think uh, Leon said, uh, uh, you know, for the intro, let's do something different. What can you can you can you play that fill backwards? Because uh, you know I did a ba da 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 da, you know, from high to low, and he said, can you do that backwards? And I said, sure. So I did it backwards, and then because he said asked me to do that, I felt a little freer to make a few other little odd changes and I played I opened the hi hat and it was something that you know you didn't hear it done like that in those days on little pop records and on the playback he he looked at me and he said you're going to be a great rock drummer and uh oh. I never I never got over that I never forgot that you know all the years that went by I always remember him saying that and I remember taking it to heart like I guess I could be a a damn good rock drummer <laughs> if I wanted to be and I still wasn't convinced that I you know that I wanted to be but then um, delving into that world you know just even a little bit I, I started to meet people like Hal Blaine and and then I met Earl Earl Palmer and a bunch of all these other studio guys and they were all very you know old oh, they were old guys you know I was still in my 20s and so I just I just uh, soaked it up. I soaked every bit of it up. And I realized what it took to play that kind of music. It, it wasn't It wasn't at all what I had, you know, what I had established in my mind, you know, that a rock, rock musician was so much, uh, so much beneath us jazz guys. And, you know, as time went on, I realized through my connections with all the pop people and all that and 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 then meeting some of my jazz idols you know that uh, that's not the way the jazz guys thought at all hmm. they weren't you know they didn't they weren't snobs like that i was just a young little ignorant snob you know basically is what it turned out to be later on i realized you know a lot of the great rock stuff had been played by jazz guys you know it all kind of tied up neatly and and then when I met the English guys for the first time, it was, you know, I met, actually, I met Eric before I met John. I met Eric Clapton was the first English rocker that I met. I, I think that was, that goes for all of us guys, Bobby Keys and all the other people that were in that band with Carl Radel and all of us. We were, I think Eric was the first one. But that whole thing of, that whole English rock, thing you know just it, it became such a big part of my life and and the musicians and they're still all my really good friends we're still all good friends with uh you know all of us who are left standing <laughs> a lot 
of them are gone, man. You mentioned already a lot of of great musicians who are from Oklahoma. Carl Radel, Leon Russell. How do you think coming from Oklahoma has had an effect on you? Well, I believe that, uh, and, and of course, the thing is, uh, I don't know what it's like to be from uh, Ohio or, or New York or anything. I mean, I do sort of know what it's more what it's like to be from New York because of all my New York friends and all the time I've spent in New York, I could almost consider myself a New Yorker in a way. But, you know, what I know about coming up is Oklahoma and Tulsa specifically. And as the years have gone by, I've, I've begun to realize what a great blessing that was to be born in a, in a place like Tulsa, Oklahoma. It, it, it just, it, I won't go on about what it's like, you know, but it, it, it was a, it was a great place and it had everything that a, that a kid could possibly have coming up, uh, especially with, with a dad like I had. I had the most incredible father. He was a drummer and he sold his drums, his first drum set to marry my mom. And my mom warned him. That uh, she said, "Oh, you're gonna, we're gonna have a boy someday, and you're gonna wish you had those drums." <laughs> and he said, "Oh no, I'll, I'll get him some new drums." And sure enough, he did. He got me a, he got me an old, beautiful old Slingerland set for my thirteenth birthday from uh, Dick Borden's pawn shop down on South Main in Tulsa. That was the beginning for me. You know, I just I loved playing those drums and. And my dad encouraged me, you know, it helped that he was a drummer. And my mom encouraged me. My mom was the greatest mom in the world. So put all that together with, you know, being from a place down there where they talk like that. And (laughs) and everybody's, you know, just cool. Everybody was, it was just all good people, I I recall, in Tulsa. My mama was a, a little Mexican lady beautiful Mexican lady and her family were all ensconced there and they were all it was it was all I never saw any kind of prejudice or anything there in Tulsa and I I, later on in life I appreciated that fact you know having known you know the stories of what it was like for people my black friends to what they went through uh, or what their parents went through in other places in the in our great country you know it just we, we've just been evolving, right? You know, we've been evolving. We we still are, and, and I think it's getting better. I think we're evolving to a really good place now. Hopefully, it looks that way. But yeah, my my uh, my upbringing in Tulsa shaped the music that I that I feel in my bones, and what I expect. You know, what I expect to be great, and what I expect to be not so great, and all that. All that stuff was shaped by by that place that I came up in. And then to, to later on to find out that uh, Leon Russell and Carl Radel and and J.J. Kale, so many, you know, later on Jamie Oldacre, God bless his soul, a uh, great drummer. You know, just, just there's a whole list of, of, of the Tulsa guys. Uh, and later on, to find out that I was one of those guys, it, it, it was always it always made me feel really great. Especially Leon, you know, Leon. Leon had a. I, I will say this. Let me say I, I'll probably veer off here a little bit from your question, but uh, sure. You know, Leon, Le, Leon, and Carl and myself. We I just took it for granted that we we played well together, and then. And we we got a Leon called me one day and said uh, I, I was actually in England, and uh, he called and said, "Can you come to uh, New York? We'll meet and uh, just cut this song with uh, with Bob Dylan." And so I, that was going to be a thrill, you know, for me. I'd never met Bob before, and so uh, we met up. And oh, and then we had Jesse Ed Davis too. He had Jesse playing guitar on that. And Jesse's not from Tulsa. Jesse was from Oklahoma City. The great drummer uh, Bill Maxwell and producer Bill Maxwell, he's from uh, Oklahoma City, too. So there's a bunch of Okies. 
But so for that session for Bob, it was uh, it was me, Carl, Leon, and Jesse Ed. And uh, that day, the song we recorded was uh, "Watching the River Flow." Just and to watch Bob be finishing off the song. I think he was finishing it off while we recorded, while we were in the room, to watch that whole process and and then to hear the playback was one of the great moments of, in my life. Hmm. I remember thinking later, not then, but later, I remember thinking what a shame it was that that little team, Leon, Carl, myself, and Jesse, weren't able to do to play with other people, other other great artists, it would have been a tremendous thing. I think, anyway, that that you know, we're all Okies, and I don't know what if that meant that much or not. But I know that we were all Okies, and and the feel that we that we put together when we played was pretty incredible. It, it was, it's, it's. Uh, but you know, having said that, I, I don't. I don't like hearing myself say that, actually. Over the years, I've, I've not wanted to say that very much because it, it, it seems to be excluding, you know, other people that I've played with over the years that, that I play really good with. And so uh, I want to be inclusive in this in this thing. I, I don't want to exclude anybody because they're not there for any reason. And so I'll, I'll just say that... Uh, over the years, there have been many teams, or not many, but there have been a few teams that I have uh, felt that I was a part of, that, you know, rhythm sections that are, that are really, really great. And it's, it's fantastic to, to know that you are a part of a team like that, you know. But that was the first one. That was the first time I ever had that real feeling with uh, Leon Carl and Jesse Ed Davis. Hmm. Being that your father was a drummer, can you remember or tell us about the kind of music that you were hearing early on in the house? Yeah. Oh, yeah. My dad was a, a Benny Goodman, Gene Krupa guy. And then, you know, when he when he turned me on to Buddy Rich, you know, then I, I went crazy. And he, and he would try to explain to me the difference. You know, he said, uh, he'd, he'd say this, you know, you know Buddy... Buddy Rich has has got all that technique, but Gene swung, and then I would uh, I would take all that to heart, and I would listen, you know, and, and I made up my mind that uh, yeah, Buddy's swinging pretty hard too. <laughs> but but I loved I loved the records that he he played. He played uh, there was a song called Saturday Night Fish Fry, and I think it was Louis Jordan. I think I'm I'm not sure but I'll never forget the little you know they were uh they were LPs they were uh what the heck do you call them uh acet uh acetate recordings I mean no uh, no not acetate not the uh not the uh not the regular LP the, the, 45s. the early one No no the early the early uh 78s Ah 78s yeah. yeah and they had red label and white label and uh, that that's what I remember. And uh, and he had put them on the record player. And it just, that was the first music that I really remember, because that's what my dad loved the most. You know, Louis Jordan, he, it was, it was basically kind of the, be what what became the, it was, you could call it the beginning of R&B, in a way. But that was what he loved a lot. And, but my mom was just the opposite. My mom loved uh, country. Music. She loved, uh, although although I couldn't say country because she didn't like, you know, the, the country didn't, country was not what she was talking about. She liked uh, Leon McAuliffe and John Lee Wills. John Lee Wills was the main thing because John Lee Wills played at, at Kane's Ballroom in uh, in Tulsa. They my the early days they called it Kane's Academy, and uh, my mom and her sisters danced in there all the time. And that was the, the 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 band leader was John Lee Wills, and they played Western Swing. And then my dad, but my dad, my dad, if he was going to be involved in Western Swing, he preferred Leon McAuliffe, who played at the Cimarron Ballroom there in Tulsa. And so, and 
and he preferred Leon McAuliffe because it was more uh, it was it was more of a of a swing kind of band. It was less country sounding in a way. I that's, that's probably not accurate at all, but I think that's the way he felt about. It. I'm not sure, but that's what I remember uh, you know hearing in Tulsa a lot. That's that's and then also radio at that time would play all the all the stuff all the hits of those days which were uh, you know early 50s so i heard all that stuff joe stafford all those artists doing all those kind of songs uh, and so even today when i hear those songs it just takes me right back to being a kid <laughs> great variety of stuff that you you grew up hearing sure yeah yeah, and and uh, but I think I think my dad's influence from the from the Louis Jordan records and and all those, I think he because he being a drummer he would he would while we were listening he would he would do this thing with his teeth between his I, I still can't do it as good as he did but he would he would he'd make the sound of a hi hat opening and closing, <laughs> but he had a really cool way of doing it between his teeth and I, I never could get that down <laughs> but uh, that that made a big impression on me you know little things like that would you know they become who you are later hmm. can you recall the very first time you stepped into a recording studio and I mean just just any recording studio small big can you remember that occurrence yeah I should I should be able to. That's a, nobody's ever asked me that before, so I think you may have stumped me. But I, I um, yeah, no, yeah, it was a little place on Santa Monica Boulevard, right off of Vine. Uh, oh, and I used to know the name so well. It was uh, oh, dog, I can't remember. I can't remember the name, but it was a little little funky place. I remember being intrigued by the whole thing, the way it worked with uh, making sure that the mics were in the right position and all that kind of stuff. But I do remember feeling really at home and, and that I loved it. I loved what I loved. What what I got addicted to was playing and then hearing it back. Hmm. Tape record, you know. So all my life I had tape recorders. I bought tape recorders from First time I remember a tape recorder came out, I think I had that, whatever that one was. And then from there on, Sony would come out with these little Walkmans and stuff, and I had every one of those at one time. I'd buy one and then give it to somebody later and get a brand new one. And But I always was recording, and that was because of... Uh, of becoming addicted to that early on you know when you when you talk about recording studio that's what it is it's a place where you tape record <laughs> yeah and you know you can become really addicted to that that's what happened to me i love and still today later on tonight i might go up and, and attempt to record something Interesting. Oh, the gardeners. My wife has just alerted me that the gardeners are on their way now. <laughs> so I may have to move to another room. No another problem. Phone. Do you want me to get your phone? What's that? Do you want me to get the other phone? Yeah, can you? Yes. Good. Yeah, so I can't. Do you remember the little studio name, the place down on Santa Monica that I used, the first place I ever. You remember the guy? Oh, I can remember the guy. I see the guy's face. I can't think of his you name. Mean, A little, yeah. Well, before that. Anyway, so yeah, for, you know, from there, I made a pretty quick jump from, from little places like that to uh, to uh, playing like with Gary. See, that was, that, that first session I think was maybe, a, I, I should remember this. As, damn, I can't believe I don't remember, but I think it might have been at Western Recorders. Or no, no, Liberty Liberty Records had their own studio. Or uh, it's kind of embarrassing that I don't know that fact, but in any case, hearing the playback that day of that song and being with Leon, and, and you know, don't forget Leon was playing piano, and so that just that that had a massive effect on me, and I I wanted to do more of that. I just wanted to do more of that more than anything else. My love for jazz still was was 
big. You know, I, I played during those days. I, I ended up playing with Gabor Zabo. I was playing with a little band called uh, the Afro Blues Quintet Plus One. And uh, everybody always used to think that the plus one was me, the white guy. <laughs> but uh, but the plus one was actually uh, Joe Diaguero, the uh, Mexican kid. And all the other guys were my good friends and brothers. Uh, and uh, we had a great time. We, we played a little clubs around um, around L.A. and and uh, you know, but I was already getting busy with the rock and roll world, so I kind of was uh, I was letting them down a bit. You know, they had to replace me, and and uh, with Gabor, I would be with him, and then I would go do some go to England or somewhere rock gig or, and then uh but but playing with Gabor Zabo was a very special time because that was uh the uh, the person that got me that gig was my best friend Albert Stinson the bass player and Albert was uh he was a genius he was like 3 maybe 3 years younger than me which meant he was really young because we were all very young at that time he he was Albert was like 17 I think or some 16 or 17 we didn't realize he was a genius uh, until later, but and then he he burnt out. He died so early. He died at age of 25, I think. And uh, just one of the saddest moments of my life. Hmm. Yeah, because he was he was a perfect example of why I always have said drummers. Uh, if a drummer gets a chance to play with uh, uh, an incredible, not just bass player, a uh, keyboard, any any other musicians, if a drummer can hook up with somebody that's just amazing as a player, they will uh, they will improve. It'd be like a master class, you know, in uh, like an everyday master class. And that's what it was like for me playing with uh, Albert and Albert and Gabor together. You know, and then the, I'd go to the pop world and I'd be playing with somebody like Leon. You know, so it 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 was it was ready made for for uh, for what it became. You know, for my my career. I mean, I just I I couldn't I couldn't have dreamed it up. I couldn't have it, it couldn't have, it just went that way. You know, hmm. and uh, but that but that's the whole thing. You know, I just I've been blessed all my life with playing with amazing people. And uh, that that just always made the difference. I both watched this and I listened to the audio version of this, but I want to call the attention of the audience to a great interview that you did on a show called Jesse's Office. And it's really, really interesting in many different ways. And one of the things you said in the that interview, you said that, Lennon and Dylan were the two artists who didn't tell you how to play. What do you think that that says about them? Wow, that's that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That is true. When was that interview done? Do you know? I think it was done like a year or two ago. Oh, a year or two. Okay. Great interview. Well, the, the thing, I guess the point I was making was that uh, those two guys being sort of the top of the heap, you could say, you know, that uh, an interesting fact, you know, being that they, uh, so John and Bob being two examples of that, you know, always told me that basically that they, uh, they wanted to see, especially Bob, this is in, in Bob's case, it's, it's, it's even more so than John. I think, you know, John was cut down so early on. It, it's just one of the, one of the most horrible, sad things in the music world because, Imagine what John would have been doing later on in life, but he shared that same feeling with with uh, Dylan. I'm sure about wanting to see how something may unfold, rather than try to shape it, you know, too soon. So they both shared that feeling with Bob, even more so. Bob is is even more that, like that than than anybody really I know. He really wants something to happen that he's not expecting. And I think even probably when he has a good notion of what he what he wants, if he's with people that he trusts, you got to, there there has to be a certain amount of trust, then he will encourage that. 
he'll he'll want to see what goes what happens and the thing with bob is that he may not tell you what he wants or or tell you what to do but he certainly knows what he doesn't want to hear and i understand that because i i have that in me too i'm i'm exactly the same thing i i may not know what i want to do but i know what i don't want to do hmm or i may not know exactly what i want to hear but i know what i don't like hearing mhm I think that's kind of where that comes from. But yeah, those two guys shared that same thing. And that and that's wonderful, you know, when you when you run into that because you as a player because they're putting their trust in you to, you know, to do what you uh what you might want to do. And I I just love I love hearing a song and seeing seeing what it does to me. You know, cuz it's a it's 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 almost like a physical thing. A song can can transform you. It can touch you in such a way that uh that you may play like you never played before ever. You may you may play some stuff that you've never played before. When that happens, this just it, it doesn't get any better than that. You know, that's it doesn't happen often enough, obviously, but that's how important the music is, really, that you're called upon to play. I mean, I don't I, I don't I've never Oh, that's what I, I just keep saying this over and over again. I hope I'm not sounding like a, a broken record, but you know, that to be able to play with people who bring you really great songs to play on, that's the whole thing. That's the, that's the, the greatest part of this whole thing is, is to be able to play on really great songs. I just love that. And, and I'm not talking about, you know, epic stuff, uh, you know, cause there, there's all kinds of, like I, I love, like anybody else, I like a song that's provocative, you know, lyrically, uh, makes me think or, or tells me something that I didn't know or, or reminds me of something, you know, uh, lyrics are, are what makes a song live forever, you know, mm-hmm. but great lyrics with a set of changes that just happen to be magical. Then you, you know, then if you're a player playing on, on that song, wow. That makes it where it's not work any longer. So I, I've always considered that I've, I'm, I've never worked a day in my life, except when I worked in the music store. <laughs> Even then, I didn't <laughs> work very much. But uh, no, this, this is not work, you know? It occurs to me, just with the incredible number of records that you've played on, you have had the chance to work alongside some of the just all-time greatest producers, everyone from Phil Spector, Don Was, T-Bone Burnett, so, so many. Of the producers that you've worked with, who would you say taught you the most about producing yourself? Well, that's, that's a very interesting question as well. Well, I was playing for Phil Spector at such an early age, and uh, and Phil was such a... A, a big guy, you know, in those days. I mean, he was, I mean, Phil Spector was, was, you know, he was like this icon. And so I always, I, I always paid attention to what he was doing and the way he was doing it. But he, but I always figured, uh, you know, that, uh, what, what Phil did, what Phil, what Phil did, Phil never did anything without, being with the with the best he 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 had the greatest artists and then he would surround himself with the greatest musicians he could find and so that was that was rule number 1 or or lesson number 1 you know but he he could be uh harsh with people but i never I never received that from him. I never was on the receiving end of, of of anything, but really, like just I just I can I can still see his eyes looking at me sometimes when he would talk to me. He really was like just the opposite of the guy that we all came to know, you know. Hmm. It's just nothing at all like what you've read about Phil Spector. It's just so I think it's just one of the great tragedies of our business uh, of our time really I don't know just so awful but the Phil Spector I knew was not that at all the opposite of that almost and 
So I guess I mean I'd, I'd have to say I, I really, I really, uh, I, I always I, I picked up a lot from Phil. Obviously, I, I picked up a lot about about uh, about sound and, and all kinds of different things. I, I shared I shared his love of uh, wetness in the sound. I've always loved that, you know. And then we over the years we that's kind of gone. Got, we got into being more dry and stuff, and it's okay. There's there's all kinds of ways to do things, you know. T Bone, I worked so much with T Bone over the years. I love T Bone's uh, his the way he the way he treated people, and the way he reveres the music. I think that's what I got from T Bone. And Don, actually, Don, pretty much the same thing, really, even more so. Don is just such a pussycat, you know, but he's really, he he really cares. Uh, he really he he really. Uh, I, I think that's the the thing that uh, that I've learned mostly from the people that I've worked for as as producers, is um, the the people that really want to get it, want to really really do things in a great way, rather than just uh, like as if it were a job, you know. And also, you want to try to, you know, there's, uh, there's, what, what is unique, you know, what, what is unique? There's no answer to what is unique, hmm. but you, you hope that whatever it is you're doing is going to have some unique quality. And, and I think that's the, that's, that's what I look for in, in, uh, but that's what I, I look to see, you know, from, you know, when I'm working with different people. And, and those guys you just mentioned all had that. Yeah, I, that, it's, there's, there's a lot of different, there's, for some reason, I'm, it's, uh, some of the names I want to say are escaping me right now. It's, uh, it's too bad because I've worked with some great producers, you know. Arif was fantastic. Jerry Wexler was a different kind of producer. But look what he did, you know, all the stuff he did. My God, you know. Hmm. At the beginning, I was talking about, or introducing, rather, the two albums that you produced for Jerry Lee Lewis, which I have a real fondness for those recordings. Oh, good. Rock and Roll Time and, and Mean Old Man. Yeah. Is there a certain kind of mood that you tried to set when you were producing those no, you know, you know, those those I I got involved in those records because of my friend Steve Bing. Uh, Steve was is a, there's a whole other interview or a whole other Steve is like a movie. He's like the the great documentary that needs to be made. When I talk about Steve Bing, this is a very unusual man, and and he's gone now. But he. Loved Jerry Lee Lewis over the moon. Jerry Lee Lewis was his personal hero. So Steve talked me into uh, playing on uh, on one of his records. He had a, a another friend of his, Jimmy Rip, produced the first record, uh, Last Man Standing. And so I was down for it. You know, I I loved playing with Jerry Lee. I played with Jerry Lee before in some live settings with other. Other groups of people, and, uh, and you know, it was with, when Jerry Lee was uh, quite a bit younger, and it was fantastic. You know, how can you you can't miss playing with Jerry Lee Lewis, but he's also he's he's got a reputation for being really hard on musicians. You know, and so I, I just said, sure, you know, it'll be a session for me, and I'll have fun, and, and I'll make it fun, and, and so we, I did the Last Man Standing, and it was great. And did it for basically for for Steve, you know, because that's that was what he wanted to do. And then when he, when that record was done, he wanted to get started on another one immediately. <laughs> and this time he wanted me to produce it. And so I I tried to get out of it actually a couple of times. I, I Steve, you know, you you um you might want to rethink this, you know, because. I, I won't be able to deal with with problems, you know. I just want to do the music, you know. And I and I'm not a you know a psychologist or anything. I can't. I'm not going to be able to like, you know, 
and so he, he he assured me that you know he would be there as the executive producer and uh, make sure that everything went well. So when I started, you know Jerry Lee, we would basically just I didn't pick the songs. That's the that was the one thing that uh, that uh, Steve wanted to make sure that he did. He picked all the songs, all the material. I was at odds with just a couple of them, and, and but in, instead of uh, making an issue out of it, I just tried to make the best that we could of them. And I and and it, interestingly, a couple of those songs are are some of my favorites actually now. So what I did was I just made sure I got the 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 players that I wanted to to be playing with Jerry Lee, you know, guys that I knew would be able to. Uh, not keep up with him, but you know, to, but be with him, you know, be be right there with him, and not be intimidated in any kind of way or, or whatever. Because Jerry has a tendency to to rush; he's known for that. And and what's interesting to me that I found out as a producer that I would never have known before was that he he's very well aware that he does that, hmm. and he's and he doesn't necessarily want to, but he. He's, you know, he's he's been called out enough times in the past, and probably really, really attacked, went in attack mode <laughs> against whoever was doing that. But the thing is, you know, knowing that was helpful to get the guys, you know, to play who knew that, and then and then just go in and let him play. And so all we did really was just follow him. That's the way the tracks were done. You just follow Jerry Lee, and. Uh, all the material he knew well enough, you know, to that he was at, at very much at home with. And then um, when it came to you know sweetening and and other things, you know, figuring out how to put the record together, uh, that was the fun part for me. I really enjoyed that whole process. But the actual tracking with Jerry Lee was uh, went a lot smoother than I expected. Hmm. And and I just wanted him to like the records, and 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 he did. You know, the, you know those records are, are not. They weren't, you know, extremely well received. Uh, I mean, there weren't any bad reviews I, that I recall. I think that all the re- reviews were were okay. You know, but I think probably a lot of people, you know, didn't. They wanted. Uh, I, I think material-wise, uh, song-wise, they they wanted uh, there were some differences of opinion there with with some people. Some some of my my musician friends mentioned that, and all I could say was, you know, I had no choice in the songs. I I tried, but but it was up to uh, Jerry and Steve. And but then, as I say, listening back to those records, I always enjoy it. I really enjoy it. I'm I'm proud. Of my work on those records, I'm I'm proud of the way Jerry sang and played. I had to do a little adjusting with Pro Tools. You know, they you can uh, you can do things with that. You can abuse Pro Tools really badly, and it is it's it's abused. It used to be abused a lot. You know, if uh, if there was a a really good performance and a really bad clam, just you can fix the clam, and that's good. And I like that. I like being able to do that. So I'm glad to hear you say you 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 enjoy those records. So I, I think uh, I think over over time people will go when when as time goes on people will say uh, Jerry Lee Lewis. Okay, uh, well, uh, oh yeah, there was there he was when he was a very very young man. What did he do later on in life? And they'll listen to those records, and I think they'll really love them. Hmm. <laughs> I do love those those albums, these recent ones from him, but there's one thing that's it surprised me in a good way. I guess it just I guess it surprised me in terms of the choice. It's impressive that the Bob Dylan song on Rock and Roll Time, it's a pretty I think anyways, it's a pretty deep cut stepchild. You know, it's mm. a, Yeah. That's right. Was that Jerry's call or that was Steve's call. Ah, okay. Interesting. Yeah, and I and, and a great one. Yeah, Stepchild? Jesus, I mean, I, I, it's like the song was written for Jerry. <laughs> he nailed it, absolutely. Yeah, he really did. I really like that version. Wow, that's nice. 
Speaking of Bob Dylan, he's going to be turning 80 next month. Right. You said one time, people are always trying to figure Bob out. Have you? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have. I think I figured Bob out a long time ago. Yeah? The, the thing is, the, the thing is that uh, I think people in their relationships, you know, you you, it, it's, uh, I know there's a word for it and I don't know what it is. But I just, I call it, uh, identify. You know, we, you, you, you meet somebody, you, you get to know them and you identify with them, right? In various ways. And of all the people I know in, in this business, this music business, I feel like I'm more like Bob than any of them, than anybody else, I should say. Huh. Yeah. So, and so, like, what does that mean? I'm, I'm not sure. I, I could, you know, we could, I could bore you with all kinds of probably trying to come up with things and figure out stuff. But uh, all I can tell you is that overall, I feel like that I, I know that there, there's, that, that like what, like, for instance, the things that annoy people about Bob are the same things I know, I feel in my bones. I, I know about that and for me personally I have I never was annoyed by Bob ever I always ever just wanted to be around Bob that's 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 very telling I would say Bob is one of those people Bob is like that for George Harrison George and I used to talk about Bob all the time Bob George Bob was George's biggest hero hmm and and I I know that that for George a lot of times you know I mean there were there were all these musical projects and things going on but but it, it really in essence what he just wanted he just wanted to hang out with Bob. Hmm. What does Bob Dylan mean to you? Well, Bob Dylan to me, I think I think Bob represents. Well, I, th I think probably what I would say about Bob is that he he's 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 he does and says he says does sings writes plays he does the things all the way that I would love to do them if I were like him if I were doing things like that he did if I were a singer songwriter that's what I would be wanting to do. I would be wanting to, I would be wanting to be able to tap into my great love, and his his great love. All you have to do is listen to his songs, and you you, you know you can every clue the, about Bob is in his songs. I I'm I'm convinced of that, and and you know, but people want more, especially if it's if it's too difficult. You know, and it can be difficult, I, I suppose. You know, for me, I just, I just like his songs. I like the provocation. I, I like how, I like what I feel when I hear his songs. This new album was ridiculous. Oh yeah. I, I mean, what it does to you, you know, it's, it's, but, but for some people, it's not enough. So. And it, and you know, in that case, and you just you you're never gonna, you know. Hopefully, maybe you get to meet the guy sometime or something. You know, I had I remember uh, I love telling people that there were times with Bob where he made me laugh so hard because he can he, he this this you don't people don't think of Bob Dylan as being funny, right? I don't know if they do or not. I but probably not. But he he can be a he's a really funny dude, <laughs> and um, you know I think it, it's just too bad that a lot of people are never going to know that. I can tell you his radio show has made me really laugh <laughs> at times, and some of the little quips are so funny. Yeah, right. <laughs> that, that's that's a little insight there, you know. But you what you what you said here it was very well put, I think. Recently, yep. on the show, 
We had an opportunity. I had never heard a full-length interview with this gentleman who has uh, an Oklahoma connection, big time, born in Birmingham, Alabama, but we, we had on Willis Allen Ramsey. And oh, Willis Allen, right. You played on that, just a great record, an iconic record. Can you recall that album, Willis Allen Ramsey? Man, I, I recall him, I, I recall him, and I recall the project. But but I don't, I can't, I can't put my put the music in my head right now for some reason. But I definitely, because of our wonderful Spotify world, thieves that they are, <laughs> I'm going to listen to him. I'm going to listen to that record. What was the record called again? It was called Willis Allen Ramsey. Oh, yeah, that's right. Came that's out right. in 1972. Yeah, I'm going to give that a listen. You have done so many different things from all these albums, producing. Is there anything that you would like to do that you haven't yet? Well, I've got... <laughs> it's funny you ask that question right now because... Just today, earlier this morning, I talked to my dear friend, and I'm, and we're about to do something I've never done before. So <laughs> my wife is going, no, I'm not. I'll see you. All right, be careful, please, out there. Yeah. And so, anyway, so that's a... That's uh, talking about Jimmy. So I'm going to be able to do one of those, but I can't speak about it right now. I can't talk about it so that's sorry about that no problem it's a terrible thing to do <laughs> but um as far as you know I, I i don't know i don't think um what i'd like to do is uh i'd like to get my room back up and running and get back into the slot where i was at just for a little while and then i got you know things one thing or another started changing and, and then covid happened and then just you know but uh, I love recording in my room. I love making up my my own little songs. I have I have a way of doing things myself compositionally that's really cool. You know, I use all kinds of little gear, samplers, and funny things, and I I really love that. And I and I I had an outlet for it early on with uh, Ry Cooter, and um, we wrote a couple of a little songs together. I want to. I'd love to get back to doing that. That's what I really, really would love to do. That's not something that I guess your question was: have, Is there something you've never done? But uh, I don't. That, nothing comes to mind. So that must be. It must be that I just want to be able to get back to what I was doing. It's been a really. I don't know about you, but I mean, it, it's you know, COVID is obvious, but somehow or another. My mind, you know, was 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 on other things, and, it, and that's too bad. I I just wanted to uh, I wanted to follow through with my in my room doing some stuff, and 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 it seemed like every day there was some kind of new thing going on, some earth shattering, awful, ugly shit, you know. Mm-hmm. So I think there was that, and then and then and then we had COVID, <laughs> so we went from one monster to the next. Hmm. But uh, anyway, so we we don't have to go on. <laughs> there were some interesting projects that I listened to from you to prepare for this interview. I listened to your work on the Jim Oblon Sunset record. Oh, yeah. And I listened to the, the Charlie Watts and Jim Keltner project. And it, it was really interesting to hear that kind of work that you'd done. I really enjoyed those. Wow, that's nice to know. Yeah. That's nice. Is that the kind of thing you you would envision yourself creating in the room more more instrumental, more experimental kind of things? Yeah, yeah, really really more instrumental kind of stuff, yeah. Although having said that, um I, I like vocalizing some things. It's it, you know, it just has to be the right thing. That's what I'm talking about. I mean, you know, to, but that only comes through experimenting to being able to put the time in. And that, that's what I really want to do. Yeah, the, the Charlie project was, was so much fun. Just hanging with Charlie was so great to be able to, uh, 
tap into that side of Charlie that nobody, not a lot of people know, was fantastic. You know, Charlie is a great jazz lover. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he... That, those are our, most of our conversations are about that, about the jazz guys. But yeah, that was that was a fantastic project. I love doing that. I can't resist asking about this. It's one of the best concerts, if not, I think it could be the best concert I ever saw. I saw Simon and Garfunkel, the Old Friends tour, back in two thousand three, oh, wow. and you were the drummer on that tour. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. Do you have any memories of that? Oh yeah. Yeah, I I um uh, I'd love that. That was uh I, I we they're all great musicians and uh and I got to hang with uh, with my man. Oh my god, why oh no, please. Jamie. Jamie hey dad. Yeah. He we we had such a great time. They, you know, Paul Paul musically Paul is is just he's like a dream you know to work with he he was he 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 loves rhythm i mean he's you know he's he's like a he he you know all his records have been like that uh, there's always been some quirky something good about the rhythm you know and and that's why you know Steve Gadd has always been his drummer for many years the the rhythm is a very important part of of Paul's writing and so to be able to play those songs live with him with really good musicians was uh it was just one of the highlights of my life yeah that was i loved that tour i'm glad to hear you say that not very many people talk about that but i loved that tour it was fantastic i expected to see fireworks between paul and uh and artie uh, because of everything i'd heard and I didn't see one, and that, that was kind of a disappointment in a way. Hmm. They just loved each other, you know, and and it, it showed. It showed every every now. I think there was one little thing somewhere. I'm not sure where it was even, but I, I think it happened on stage, and I can't. Even, it's sort of vague to me. But but overall, they had a great time, and um, and it just was. And I think it was a very successful tour. So it was amazing. <laughs> yeah, I'm really glad to hear you say that, man. That's good. I frequently say it's the best show I ever saw. I, wow! I, it was just whew, transcendent. I know that's a, that's a big word, but to use, but it was just it was incredible. Yeah, that's 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 the way I felt about it. That's good. <laughs> glad to hear that. Is there a compliment that has meant the most to you through the years? Well, I told you about the first one from Leon. Right. That was a that was a big deal to me. You know, I could get that's one of those kind of questions I could it's one of those where I keep I I I want to I want to I want to say something like, you know, when my dad told me when my dad when my mom actually, wow, you know what? It was the it was that tour. That you just talked about. It was it was the Simon and Garfunkel tour that my dad said turned to my mom. When we played L.A., obviously, she and my mom told me later. My dad turned to my mom and said, "Well, the kids still got it." <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, that that's so freaking cool. And for my dad, you know, I just. I had a, a good relationship with my dad, but uh, I wanted it to be better. I I, uh, I, I caused him a lot of grief. Hmm. I always wanted to to make up for that somehow. But I just anyway, I I loved I loved the way he said that and the way my mom told me. But uh, yeah, I'm sure you know there've been so many wonderful people in my life. Uh, and so many great compliments and things. Uh, George, George always was, George was such a dear, 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 sweet friend. I always just end up saying to people, I wish you'd, I wish you'd have been able to know George, you know. Hmm. Same thing that I said about Bob a minute ago, it applies to George, you know. They, they, those guys, uh, they're just, 
they're not only just amazingly gifted musicians and stuff, but they were really cool guys, really great guys to hang out with. And and like I say, you know, that's just it's the way the way it works, you know, in the world. You can't know everybody. <laughs> what is the best thing about being Jim Keltner? Wow. What's the best thing about being Jim Keltner? I'd say probably the fact that I lived through the things that took all, most of my other friends down. <laughs> hmm. It took Harry Nielsen down. It took Georgie down. It took Oz. It took down so many people. And I just, I just had this talk with my one and I, the guy that I can't tell you about just a minute ago. And uh, I spoke with Nathan first, and then I, and, and but, but, you know, my point was that I was. I was saying that I'm, I hope you're taking really good care of yourself because I don't want you to be going. You know, they're all leaving. Everybody in my generation. You know, I'm so, I'm very old now, man. I I I got to be really old, and my genius. I had I was really really fortunate to be around a lot of geniuses, and I'm not talking just music. Actually, the first first genius I ever encountered in my life died very young and um without him in my life uh, i i i wouldn't have the skills that i have now for not not nothing to do with music but how to take care of myself hmm. and so i've been really really fortunate with that i've had i've had you know and then i i told you about albert that this this guy because of him you know i have i have a love for bartok uh, I, I have a love for Stravinsky that I probably would have never. Who would have turned me on to it? You know, some friends would have probably at some point. But when you, when this happens to you, when you're a very young man, not even in your twenties yet, or or very early twenties, and it's that bonding time, you know, when you're just sitting around smoking and and you know, with a little glass of wine and and you know, digging some music, right? You know, I mean this. This 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 cat this Albert Stinson Albert was Albert turned me on to everything my love for for that I had already loved jazz so much and then when he turned me on to different things different people J J Johnson when he turned me on to a certain Miles record uh, when we listened to Coltrane together and stuff uh, th th those were those were moments that changed me forever. You know, that, that became who earlier when we were talking, you know, that's, that, that's who I am musically inside, you know, no matter what I'm playing on. So I think the I think the fact that I had so many of those kind of people in my life, you know, we, you know, the, the famous ones and all, you know, but there were others. And, I think the fact that I had all those people in my life to to I think that's what I would say is is uh, what was your question again the what's so the best, best thing, thing about being me yeah mm -hmm. I, I think is is uh, being able to look back and and see how how I got to this place because it's a pretty good place to be especially in light of the fact that uh, my friends are are going uh, just just on a regular. Rate at a regular rate. Ah, I don't even want to talk about it. Uh, you know, the, a very young drummer friend of mine just died. He, he got leukemia of all things, and mm. and tried to fight it, and uh, and didn't 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 make it. You know, he's like twenty twenty some odd years younger than me. So, you know, not only the old guys are departing, but the young ones too, and. Uh, so I think that it's it's uh and I, and I'll even take the opportunity to tell you I don't know you Paul how old are you unless unless that's not a question you like to answer you know as more and more my friends don't want to answer. I'll tell you this I was born in the eighties oh, okay you were born in the eighties oh well then you're a youngster <laughs> that's, right. that's right so you're a young man so then this doesn't apply to you necessarily I, actually it no it absolutely does apply in fact it applies to you more hmm. If you're that young, you should take it upon yourself to learn, put a, put as much passion 
that you because I know you 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 know so you're obviously passionate about your music and the and the this world that you 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 have created for yourself. Put that much passion into your health. Hmm. Okay. Now th- this is your mom talking, right? It's 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 you know I I do this once in a while, and I'm only doing this now because Cynthia's just left. She's if she heard me right now, she'd give me the worst look. She hates it when I start telling people about their health. But I can tell you that, especially when you ask me, what's the best thing about being Jim Keltner? That's the best thing, Hmm. that I started when I was 15 years old. And I went through periods where there was the darkest stuff you can imagine. So I just can only tell you that I think... You know, amongst my many blessings, were, 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 was, that one really stands out. That's, that's you know, uh, I think, and, and, and Cynthia has a way of saying it to me. God, uh, she's always said to me, you know, God, God has, you know, he has, he has plans for us. And, but we have to pay attention. And, and a lot of people don't. A lot, a lot of people get distracted and, 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 then, and then they get embarrassed about the whole idea of God. And so, you know, it's too bad because uh, I think God, uh, you know, uh, has has had these things planned for me. And and I'm just grateful to have been paying attention the whole time because you, you take your eye off of that, take your eye off of that ball, and it's going to be out of here before you know it. Mm. Those are my things. And, and if she heard me saying this to you right now, she'd be flipping out. <laughs> But I'm just, you know, you sound like a really nice man. So I, I, I just, I'm glad to be able to share that with you. Well, I can tell you, I, I appreciate you saying the things you said. I feel like it's a, you know, a lot of people would hold back. But really, you know, when I hear you say something like, pay attention to your health, put as much attention into your health as you do, you know, your your show. Oh, it, right. It's the ultimate form of care. Like you're saying, I care about you, man. I appreciate it. Good. Good. Well done, Paul. Well, Jim, in closing, I know that there's people tuned in from all over the world. Is there anything you'd like to say to anybody who listened to this broadcast? Well, I just would say that if if you were listening to this broadcast, you're probably a pretty good bloke or girl. (laughs) So, you know, that's good enough for me right there. Just uh, I I will be I'll take this opportunity to be very corny and tell you that I love all of y'all really, really do. And that's all I want to do from now on. And I think maybe that's what I was uh, uh, wanting to do all along. And so I just want to continue. And that is to spread the love. Nice. Very nice. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, Jimmy Lee Keltner. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, man. Thank you, Paul. All right, sir. Until next time. All right. We'll, we'll speak again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bum up ba da beep ba boop da boop da beep ba da leap ba na ka da bee za wa ka ti sa ka la ki sa na wa chi ka wa 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 sa na ka ka la ki sa ka wa 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 sa a wa ra ka na ka wa 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 wa